This week, we will focus on preparing for and taking exams. This lecture is the third of three units focusing on metacognitive strategies. We will start this lecture with a discussion on how to effectively prepare for exams. Because studying directly involves our information processing system, we will begin by taking a look at the information processing model and how we can maximize it when preparing for an exam. When considering the information processing system, when you study is very important. Are you studying the weekend before or even the night before the exam? Or do you engage in a distributed study practice in which you study a little bit each day over a period of a week or two? Why is this question important? Let's take a look. What happens in the information processing system if you cram, that is, if you use massed practice? You are literally trying to cram the information into your working memory in hopes that it gets into your long-term memory and you can retrieve it the next day on the exam. But we know that our working memory has a very small capacity and a very short duration, so cramming usually results in cognitive overload. As a result of this overload, some of the information simply spills out. Think about a sponge. If you douse it with water all at once, some of it simply rolls off. But if you pour water onto a sponge slowly, you can get a lot more water in. But what about the information that doesn't spill out? At least that will get into our long-term memory, right? Well, when you engage in mass practice, you do not store information and you certainly do not encode it. You are simply depositing information. We also know from previous units that when information is not well encoded, you cannot retrieve it. Simply depositing information into our long-term memory is so detrimental because our brains naturally work by associating information. Think about pieces of information being deposited into the long-term memory as isolated information with very weak, if any, associations to prior knowledge. This makes retrieval very difficult, which of course will reflect in your learning and your grade on the exam. A distributed study practice is beneficial for encoding and retrieval of information, even if you are studying the same amount of time you would have in a cramming session, meaning... Studying for one hour a day for five days before the test will yield better results than studying for five hours the day before. Why is this so? Studying for a shorter amount of time over several more days reduces the amount of cognitive overload, which not only helps to prevent the spilling out effect, but which also leaves more working memory capacity for engaging in meaningful learning. Also, Having several days of reviewing the information being studied helps to strengthen the new narrow pathways that are developing as you are learning. This, of course, impacts retrieval in a positive way. Now that we know why it is important to have a distributed study practice, let's take a look at what we should be doing when we're studying. As we are preparing for exams, it is important to utilize several credible sources. Most students will study from textbooks and lecture notes, but it is also important to use prior exams or quizzes. This will help you to become aware of where your strengths and challenges were in the past so that you can plan better for the upcoming exam. Also, using the professor's PowerPoints is helpful because they tend to highlight what the professor sees as important to learn. With this in mind, an exam review session in class is also a great way to determine what the professor wants you to know. The syllabus may also have clues as to what is expected on the test. Lastly, classmates can be a great resource because they may be able to help you better understand concepts. Or having to help others better understand concepts will actually improve your own learning as well. This list represents a lot of sources to pull information from. So once we're ready to study, how do we even begin to know where to start? This is why we need strategies. When studying, we want to focus on pulling important ideas and concepts from our sources in order to organize and elaborate on them. Outlining material in books can be a helpful way to pull key concepts from the book. This will prevent you from having to go back to the book to study, which can be overwhelming for your working memory. Summarizing information in your own words is also beneficial, 
because we have to make sense of something before we can put it in our own words. Creating representations such as hierarchies or matrices is a great way to organize information. You will then be able to study from this representation, which will dramatically reduce cognitive overload. Lastly, the most important strategy a student can use when preparing for an exam is to predict and answer potential questions. The whole point of studying should be to engage in this activity. This is also where creating mirror and summary questions in your book or notes throughout the semester can be very beneficial because you'll already have several questions to help you assess your learning. The extent to which you are able or not able to answer the questions you or even your study mates have created will quickly point out to where the gaps in your learning are. Now, it is extremely important that when you are predicting and answering questions, you create both lower and higher level questions. Remember, while your professor may focus on lower level information in the lecture, the questions on the exams will largely be higher level questions. On the next two slides, we will revisit how to use Bloom's taxonomy to create questions. Recall that the remember and understand categories are the lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy while the apply, analyze, evaluate, and create categories are the higher levels. Here are some active verbs for each of the levels that you can use when creating questions to prepare for an exam. Let's look at an example of how we would use these verbs to prepare for an exam on use of time. In applying Bloom's taxonomy to create higher and lower level questions about the use of time, an active verb has been taken from each box and used here. As we're going through these questions, reflect on how much cognitive processing or thinking you would have to do before you could answer these questions on an exam. How much more information would you need to be able to retrieve from your long-term memory in order to successfully answer the higher level questions? Remember, what is the root cause of time management issues? While we didn't use the verb recall, the verb recall is implied in the phrase, what is the root cause? Understand, explain why it is important to plan for a perfect storm. Apply, how would you schedule the following tasks in order of priority? Analyze. How are time management and procrastination similar and different? Evaluate. After reading the following scenario, assess whether Eric has a time management or procrastination problem. Explain how you know. Create. How would you design a study routine that implements time management strategies? The level of detail needed to answer the create question is much greater than the remember question. Oftentimes, when students are preparing for an exam, they quiz themselves using only the remember and understand levels. These lower level questions result in only rote learning. On the other hand, asking higher level questions results in more meaningful learning, which is conducive to encoding and retrieval. We'll now focus on strategies to use when actually taking an exam, but it is important to remember that test-taking strategies are not a substitute for effective exam preparation. So there you are, sitting in your class, waiting for the exam to start. The professor has asked you to clear your desk and put away your book. It's just you, your long-term and working memory, and a number two pencil. How do you feel? What are you thinking about? Are you breathing a little faster? Is your heart racing? Are your palms sweating? Are you engaging in negative self-talk? If so, you may be dealing with test anxiety and the worry and emotionality that it causes. When students have test anxiety, it is important to determine what type of anxiety is being experienced. When trying to determine what type of test anxiety you are experiencing, you can ask yourself, is my test anxiety rational or irrational? If the test anxiety is rational, you may be able to say, I usually am not prepared well enough. If the anxiety is a direct result of a lack of preparation, you should consider it a normal rational reaction. 
If this is the type of test anxiety you are experiencing, then you need to reevaluate the time and effort you put into preparing for exams. This includes your study strategies and the willingness to seek help. However, if the following statement is true, I prepare well, but still have anxiety. That is to say, if you are adequately prepared but still panic and or overreact, then your reaction is not rational. In either case, it is important to manage your anxiety because the worry it causes can take up valuable working memory space you will need during the exam. So how do we manage anxiety? We have to address both the emotionality and the worry of anxiety. First, we'll discuss the former. Emotionality causes the physiological symptoms of test anxiety, such as the rapid breathing and rapid heart rate. When we're experiencing these symptoms, it means that our fight or flight response has kicked in and everything is speeding up so we can run away or fight. In its simplest terms, anxiety is just extra energy and the best way to manage this physiological symptom is exercise. If you are particularly anxious about an exam, you may want to take a brisk walk or even jog for 20 or 30 minutes the night before the exam or the morning of. This will help bring oxygen to your brain through increased blood flow and help to calm down some of your nerves. But if you're already sitting in class experiencing physiological symptoms, there are other techniques you can use. Believe it or not, changing positions can also help you relax. Another way to slow everything back down is to engage in abdominal or diaphragmatic breathing. With abdominal breathing, we want to engage our diaphragm so we can breathe more deeply. A good way to do this is to focus on pushing your stomach out like a beach ball when inhaling. If you are still having trouble breathing deeply, try to exhale as much air as possible for as long as possible without holding your breath. You will then be able to inhale more deeply. This slow and controlled breathing will help your body send the message to your brain that you are safe and there is no need to panic. You can also use progressive muscle relaxation by first tensing your muscles for 5 seconds and then relaxing them. You can do this with different muscle groups from head to toe, starting with your forehead, then to your eyes and nose, all the way to your feet. It's important to note that with these last two techniques, practice improves your technique as well as the benefits. Since both abdominal breathing and progressive muscle relaxation will help you to relax, you could take a couple of minutes to practice them before you fall asleep. This strategy is much better than trying these techniques for the first time when you really need them. Coupled with the physiological symptoms caused by emotionality are the cognitive symptoms of worry that we experience with anxiety. One of the more prevalent cognitive symptoms we engage in is negative self-talk. The most common types are that of the worrier, critic, victim, and perfectionist. Think back to our unit on the regulation of emotions and recall that the irrational beliefs we engage in during negative self-talk are largely automated and subconscious. For this reason, it is important to listen and become aware of these irrational beliefs so they can be addressed and disputed. One great way to manage negative self-talk is to engage in RET, or Rational Emotive Therapy. In this way, irrational beliefs such as, I'll never be able to pass this test, can be disputed. More recent studies regarding self-talk have actually found that when we're disputing our irrational beliefs, it helps to use our name as opposed to using the pronoun I. For example, you could say, Christine, you are prepared for this exam. You use distributed practice, created representations, and higher level questions to study from. You are ready. It's been found that when people say I when engaging in self-talk, it can actually make people more anxious. Psychologists believe that by using your name and the pronoun you instead of saying I, you can get distance from the situation as well as the emotions you are feeling and this helps to relieve the anxiety or other negative emotions. As with the abdominal breathing and progressive muscle relaxation, disputing irrational beliefs improves with practice.
Another proven technique that can support the management of cognitive symptoms of anxiety is writing about your test anxiety for 10 minutes before the exam. You can write both your irrational thoughts and your disputing beliefs down. In this way, you can clear your working memory of the worry that preoccupied you, making room for you to think clearly during the exam. You can also change the perspective on the stress that you are feeling by reframing the potential threat of the test to a challenge. You actually do not want to be completely relaxed during the test, but rather to learn to harness the power of stress. While high levels of anxiety can cloud thinking, moderate levels of stress have actually been proven to enhance performance. By mentally reframing the test from a threat to a challenge, you can start to believe that the stress provokes good stress or you stress instead of bad stress or distress. It's also important not to panic when other students start to turn in their papers. Disputing thoughts can help any panic that arises to pass. Thought stopping is another technique that is helpful in managing cognitive symptoms. If you start to find that you are engaging in negative self-talk, you can literally think stop and even picture a stop sign. Lastly, using effective time management techniques during an exam can prevent you from getting to a point where you have too much test at the end of your time. Have you ever been taking a test and then suddenly the professor says five more minutes and you panic? There are effective ways to prevent this from happening. First, preview the entire test and allot time accordingly. This allows you to see the point distribution, get a sense of the difficulty of the exam, and to manage your anxiety before it manages you. Next, go where the points are. If you are concerned about running out of time, start with the questions that are worth the most amount of points. If all questions are weighted equally, answer your strengths first. This will give you a self-efficacy boost, increasing your sense of confidence, and help you to avoid getting upset. It's important to note that most college classrooms do not have a clock, so wear a watch as you will most likely not be able to have your cell phone out during the test. But don't just wear the watch, check it periodically. This is especially important because we can easily lose our sense of time while taking an exam. Lastly, save time to check your work. Try to leave at least 10 minutes at the end based on the length of your exam. So what about the actual questions? What are some strategies we can use? This answer depends on which of the two types of exams we are taking, an essay exam or an objective exam. We will now go through some test taking strategies for each of these types, including the subtypes of objective exams, which are multiple choice, true false, matching, and fill in the blank. Let's start with essay exams. One of the main problems in answering essay questions is that students do not answer the whole question or prompt. For example, an essay question may ask you to list and define key terms, but the student forgets to define the terms. It is not uncommon for entire portions of an essay prompt to be left out. What is a good strategy to avoid these mistakes? Underline or circle the key words that specify what is needed to be done. Take a minute to pause the video and see if you can spot the keywords in these two essay prompts. Did you find all of these key terms? With the last prompt, it asks that you only address three out of the five concepts. Deciding and circling which three you are going to address will help you put the other two out of your working memory. Now that you've underlined or circled the key words and know what you are actually expected to address, the next essential step in effectively completing an essay exam is pre-writing. Before you write your answer in the blue book, do the following. Create a brief outline or representation that includes main ideas and supporting details, and your position if appropriate. You can also include the beginning and ending sentences of each paragraph which will help to create a flow of thought when writing. Then, organize the main ideas into the best order for presenting your thoughts. Start with the most important ideas in case you run out of time. If you are expected to write a more formal essay, you will want to use an appropriate structure that includes the main components of an essay. 
They are the introductory paragraph, which tells the reader or grader what you are going to say in the body of your paper. The main ideas in separate paragraphs that include at least two supporting details, if not more. A closing paragraph that wraps up or summarizes what you have stated. Finally, we want to consider the reader or grader and use transitional words between and within paragraphs. This will help our ideas and paragraphs flow. Thinking about the components we just reviewed, how would you change the following essay? Pause your video to determine what changes need to be made. Were you able to recognize the changes that needed to be made? You can see here that in addition to editing some misspellings and grammatical errors, we also divided the one long paragraph into three separate paragraphs. Transition words would also need to be added as well as a concluding paragraph. When writing an essay question, what should you do as the last step? This slide helps demonstrate why proofreading and revising your essay is so necessary. Be sure to not only fix any spelling or grammatical errors that you find, but to also make sure that you are explaining your thoughts coherently. Oftentimes, points will be docked for simple grammatical errors, and as many instructors will agree, if they can't read it or understand it, it's wrong. Another great strategy to use when proofreading your paper is to underline terminology that you have used from the course. Underlining these key terms will make them stand out to your professor or TA so that they can see you are using the language from the course. For example, if you were writing an essay about the information processing system, you would underline words such as working memory, long-term memory, encoding, attention, retrieval, etc. Now we will review some test-taking strategies for taking objective exams. For multiple choice questions, you want to answer the questions you know first. This will help to increase confidence, save time, and increase the likelihood of earning maximum points. If you are ever truly stuck on a multiple choice question and absolutely have to guess, choose the answer in the middle with the most words. Professors tend to put the most effort into the correct answers, which may make them longer in length. With true and false questions, absolute terms such as always, all, totally, none, or never usually make the statement false. True statements tend to have more general terms. Also, if you cannot determine a statement to be false, assume it is true. When answering matching items, you will want to consider your working memory capacity, as these types of questions can cause cognitive overload. You will want to work from one side only, use the process of elimination if answers can only be used once, and literally cross out answers that are no longer available to use. This will prevent you from having to keep reminding yourself of which words you have and have not used, which is a waste of working memory space. Lastly, with fill-in-the-blank questions, use synonyms if you do not know the answer. You could receive partial credit. Finally, as you are learning this week, reflect on these questions. Do you engage in a mass or distributed study practice? How can you incorporate all available sources into your study practice? What study strategies may help you expand your toolkit? Which strategies will help you combat test anxiety? And how can you improve your test-taking strategies?